Hi, and welcome to Ones and Twos, FP's economics podcast. Every week we use data points to try to explain the world. I'm Cameron Abadi, FP's deputy editor with you in Berlin, Germany. As always, Adam Twos, FP's economics columnist and Columbia University professor, is with us this week in Scotland. Hi, Adam. Hi, Cam. So, in this week's episode, we are going to be talking about the U.S. China relationship. A couple of big speeches by the Biden administration have inspired us to look into what that relationship is in a little more detail. First, I just want to uh, make a, uh, a call to action here because, uh, as I mentioned last week, we are uh, holding a live event in Berlin on May 25th at Prachtwerk. And it turns out that those ticket sales are going very briskly, so there may not be tickets left soon. So if you're interested in coming and haven't gotten those tickets yet, I'd encourage you to get them soon. They are uh, available at podfestberlin.com or by checking the show notes for this episode. We both really look forward to seeing you in Berlin. Back to uh, the data point, and the data point there is 11 billion, as in 11 billion dollars, which is the amount that U.S. companies spent buying or investing in Chinese companies in 2022. It's just one expression of how deeply the U.S. and Chinese economies have become intertwined over time. And reducing that intertwinement has become an explicit policy goal of the Biden administration. That goal is sometimes referred to as de-risking, or decoupling, or reshoring. But it does feel like the White House is expressing mixed messages about what exactly its position towards China is. These further restriction curbs uh, by this executive order coming down the pike in the coming weeks, likely uh, from the Biden administration, would essentially be a further bifurcation of the global economy, a split between China's and U.S. On the one hand, There's a variety of policies that the White House has passed aimed to bring manufacturing of energy infrastructure and chip manufacturing back to the United States away from China, but also regulations on investments of all kinds in China itself. On the other hand, last week, Janet Yellen gave a speech trying to clarify the terms of this new rivalry with China and set very clear boundaries for it. The United States will assert ourselves when our vital interests are at stake, but we do not seek to decouple our economy from China's. A full separation of our economies would be disastrous for both countries. So we thought we'd dig into this and try to clarify the stakes of this competition and what it amounts to exactly. And I thought I would start, Adam, by contemplating some of the worst case scenarios related to this confrontation between U.S. and China on economics. I mean, what could be the economic fallout, say, from Chinese hostilities against Taiwan? This has been in the news a lot. Chinese fighter jets and warships are simulating sealing off Taiwan on the third and last day of its military drills. The joint sword exercise is a show of force following a meeting between Taiwan's president and a senior U.S. politician, Taipei, has condemned... People are talking about the potential catastrophe that could result, but yeah, what exactly would it amount to? The United States, could it apply sanctions on China of the sort it's uh, imposed on Russia after its invasion of Ukraine? And how much greater would the exposure of the Western economy be to those kinds of sanctions? If companies and banks needed bailouts in the West as a result of those sanctions, would central banks even have the necessary firepower at this time of high inflation to make those bailouts? I mean, what is the worst case scenario here? Well, I guess the sanctions scenario would be the response to a Chinese blockade of Taiwan. If the Chinese actually invaded the island, I mean, America, at least if you believe President Biden's repeated utterances, I mean, if if there's an actual invasion, then America is committed to a military response. I mean, can we just pause for a second to to just contemplate what we're doing here? I mean, it's an absolutely extraordinary state of affairs when these kinds of questions are posed with the regularity and sort of almost everyday matter of factness as they are. Uh, you know, war. You know, Congress apparently is running its own little war game. The think tanks around DC are doing them almost on a daily basis. Um, 
shooting war scenarios are being actively contemplated. And, and that's, of course, our side where we've no real way of knowing the extent of the conversations on the Chinese side. And I think, I think we really do need to pause and sort of reflect for a second on, on what this implies, because obviously national security concerns are always present in the calculus of states, and states have militaries and national security apparatuses whose job it is to regularly consider worst case scenarios. But there is a politics to this and the opening up of the possibility of this worst case as a real contingency. And if you speak to business people around the world, it is now being actively incorporated. Shooting war scenarios are being actively incorporated into business decision making. This changes reality in the present moment, whether or not we end up in that situation. You know, it's a, a huge qualitative shift and it, it makes that's what makes reading policy discourse from somebody as you know level-headed and as, as coolly calculating as Janet Yellen so difficult in the current moment because she quite naturally of course says well you know all economic policy is conducted under the proviso that that national security is an absolute priority for the American state and the American government but of course what that means depends on what kind of scenarios you're considering and and you know her, her speech is an effort to suggest that conflict is not inevitable. And and when we say conflict now, that includes this scenario. But I mean, let's get down to it. I mean, it's difficult to really grasp, to be honest. I mean, some outfits have attempted to to scheme this out. But as soon as you do, you just get dizzy very quickly. Because sure, I think you're right that there would be an immediate fallout in the financial system. I mean, probably our best way of thinking about this by way of analogy is the COVID shock. It started in China, it took China out of the world economy. It took about four or five weeks in that case for the financial markets to get really scared. And by early March, they were in complete freefall. But I have to say that I think the financial side of it is, is you know, the, this is the easy bit. This is the least of your problems, because essentially those are balance sheet operations. So I mean, we know what to do. The central banks would simply provide liquidity, buy up financial assets. That's the way that you stabilize a bank balance sheet. What I think is far harder to really figure out, and that's what really in the end was so difficult to deal with in the COVID crisis and its aftermath are the real economic implications of this. I mean, Apple does not have a plan B currently for large scale production of any of its goods other than based in China. I mean, it's trying to build and elaborate them, but it's slow going. And Apple is by some margin, the largest and the most highly valued company in the entire world. So it would face an existential dilemma on day one of this kind of conflict. Um, I don't think that's currently priced in. So you would see huge adjustments in equity prices. Microsoft and Saudi Aramco are number two and three, depending on the state of the markets. And both of those would no doubt suffer huge damage because the entire tech ecosystem worldwide will be convulsed. And every single commodity market as well. That In, in, in March uh, 2020, in the COVID crisis, it was the oil, the break in the oil market that really unleashed the landslide because oil is an indicator of global recessionary tendencies. I mean, there's really no reality uh, for the world economy since the 1990s in which China is not woven in as an integral part. So one can see why, you know, Congress and the administration digs in over Taiwan, over human rights. These are these are profoundly important values. But the question, of course, is how do you weigh them? Do we even have a calculus for weighing those issues and those concerns and those interests of the United States against this other interest, which is really the continuation of the world economy as we know it. Yeah, in terms of the policymakers who would be responsible for um, weighing this kind of strategy, yeah, I suppose the question is, would that fall under an economic policymaker or a national security policymaker? And, And maybe that strategy is sort of falling between those spheres. I mean, as you point out, in your article about Yellen's speech, I mean, she seemed to want to draw boundaries between the two spheres, but in a way, she just ended up reinforcing their enmeshment. And I guess I wanted to ask, are we entering an era where economics and national security concerns are just more closely linked in some kind of permanent, deeper sense? And is that a natural product of a great power like China rising and claiming more influence for itself as a result of its rise? I think the clearest thing that we can say, and I think this is indisputable, is that we are exiting a period in which economic growth and national security could be thought of as distinct and separate spheres. And if you think about it, 
you know, that was clearly never the case in the Cold War. I mean, all the way back to World War One and World War Two, these total wars of massive economic mobilization. And from then on into the Cold War of against the Soviet Union from the 1940s through to 1989, it was obvious that economic technological development had direct and significant ramifications for national security. And then we entered a new period which shaped much of our lives, the period since 1989, when all of a sudden, in a sense, they know that this the two drifted apart in really quite a dramatic way. Um, why? How could that have been? Well, I think on the one hand, it could simply be that, you know, as the Germans used to like to put it, you know, all of a sudden, the, the security threats have gone. The Germans used to like to say that they were surrounded by friends. you know, And so your security problem isn't really that serious. Common growth then and economic competition become the key concerns. Or, and I think this is the really key point, tacitly, the lesson drawn from the Cold War against the Soviet Union was that economic growth could be ignored as a national security factor because, on balance, it was hugely in the West's and America's favour. And so the more economic growth, the better, because broadly speaking, it handed the game to the West. Because this, in the end, of course, was the lesson of the Cold War against the Soviet Union, that economics trumped. The Soviet Union had a formidable military and a formid- you know, formidable nuclear arsenal, and it still has a formidable nuclear arsenal, but it was undone by its economic and social collapse. And and that assumption, I think, underpinned this period in which the United States and its allies could essentially watch the massive reconfiguration of the world economy with a kind of sense of complacency. And China has changed that. And that's the reality that we're dealing with now. We, we can no longer assume, and it makes no sense to assume, that economics and geopolitics can be separated in that, in that way. You know, it resonates through Yellen's speech. Um, she says, conflict is not ine- inevitable because it's easy to see a path through which Chinese economic growth does not challenge e- American economic leadership. That's the condition. And of course, Beijing sees it differently. And most of you know, China's economic growth proceeded, you might say, naturally, according to the, the pattern that is logically follows from the structure of the Chinese regime. That kind of economic growth, in some sense, does and must challenge America's leadership. And it's very significant, I think, within the US, how the balance of power has shifted as well. If you think to the early 2000s, shortly after WTO accession by China, there was all, the first uproar, the China shock was hitting the US economy. There was uproar in Congress. And the Bush administration in the early 2000s realized it needed all hands on deck to try and manage this relationship with China, which it was fully committed to developing in the interests of America and, and principally, of course, well, this is the key thing, American business. And so they appointed to manage the strategic dialogue with China, the Treasury Secretary, and the Treasury Secretary was Hank Paulson, former CEO of Goldman Sachs. Now, we are a million miles removed from that scenario in, in, in Washington, D.C. today. I mean, imagine, you know, the Biden administration say, hey, excellent. You know, we've got a, we've got a safe pair of hands and, you know, we're going to put Jamie Dimon in charge of managing the relationship with China. Right? Unthinkable. And it's significant, I think, that in a sense, Janet Yellen's speech as Treasury Secretary is, is almost positioned as a warm up act for Jake Sullivan's speech as National Security Advisor this week. So it's a... Uh, it's a very interesting sh- reshuffling of the balance of power. And, and so we are talking here about a rearrangement, yes, within, within the state structure of the US, where this whole field has become coded with national security concerns. Okay, we'll take a break right here, but stick around and we'll be back to continue talking about the US-China confrontation. So I'd like to shift here now to focus a bit more on the United States and and all the policymakers we've heard from recently have made it clear that they envision this confrontation with China happening together with other allies, although it seems like the terms of that cooperation with uh, allies has changed since the Cold War confrontation with the Soviet Union, for example. I mean, there doesn't seem to be much talk about building this alliance on the basis of free trade. No one is really talking about digging up old free trade agreements with Europe or Asia. So yeah, what is the alternative? What does cooperative industrial policy look like? 
I think this has been a huge challenge for the Biden team. Essentially, America's political economy, America's domestic politics and the interest group configurations in the US have become profoundly hostile to um, the extension of free trade market access type agreements. Um, It's a pretty open secret, I think, that had Hillary won against Trump in 2016, even though it was the Obama administration which negotiated the famous TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement that was going to build a kind of Pacific area free trade zone, even though it was the Obama administration that had negotiated that, that the Clinton team, if they had won, were not going to pursue it in Congress because so toxic did they think the politics of free trade were. Everything, I think, in their thinking starts from the premise that American democracy is fragile. And the reason why American democracy is fragile is uh, because of the huge shock delivered to the fabric of American society by globalization since the 1970s. I think this is an article of faith that this is you know, foundational. And so it's not just a matter of making concessions to interest groups that you avoid open talk of globalization and free trade and so on. It's actually part and parcel of their determined and quite serious minded effort to you know, think through the implications of the Trump presidency and and the threat that it poses as they understand it to the Republic. And so there was a big project uh, while they were in opposition, while they were out of office, um, organized around this idea of a foreign policy for the American middle class. Um, and I think that is a key core belief, article of faith, really, for this for this group. And, and that is then the rate limiting factor. So you start from the domestic, you start from the interests of, the, as they describe it, the American middle class, and you work out from there. And, and that does indeed imply that you're not going to do market access type things. You're going to do industrial policy. You're going to focus on jobs in the United States. You're going to do buy American type programs. That doesn't necessarily mean buy from American firms, as, you know, as long as European or Asian firms manufacture in the US, and they had a loud voice in lobbying over this legislation, you know, that's fair game. But the jobs need and the production needs to be in the United States, both on grounds of securing American democracy and on grounds of, as it were, securing it against external enemies. So then how do you square this with your partners? And and this has really been the struggle for the Biden administration, notably since the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act in the summer of 2022, because that also was a, you know, this is being driven not just by the administration, of course, but by Congress, which has has a deciding say in all of this, all of this legislation. So what they've done is worked a kind of diplomatic gloss, a kind of diplomatic effort to defuse, coordinate with partners around this basic shift, which is rooted in America's national domestic concerns. And the epitome of this, the real model for this was the deal that was hashed out between the EU, the, it's quite striking that it happened not for you know, French government or German government, but Brussels, the European Commission, the president of the European Commission, was a von der Leyen, and, and President Biden uh, with, their, with their meeting on March 13th. And I know that the White House regards this as really the model for future partnership. So the, the, the starting premise is both the Europeans and the Americans, for their own reasons, their own domestic reasons, will pursue policies on industrial development and green energy modernization and so on, which may create conflicts with the partner. So you need a set of bodies not to uni- make those, you know, to create homogeneity across all of those policies, but to reconcile and work through your differences. So there's a desire to achieve, as they call it, incentive compatibility. So can we rewrite the fine print of the rules of the Inflation Reduction Act or the so-called CBAM, the carbon border adjustment that the Europeans are considering introducing, which is a tax on high carbon imports, so as to avoid conflict between the United States and Europe. Can we cooperate in defining areas of technological interest, which mean the Americans don't need to strong arm the Dutch into depriving the the Chinese, denying to the Chinese essential lithography machinery for making chips, because the Europeans and the Americans have agreed in advance on a set of technological priorities. Can Europe and the United States agree on strategic raw materials that they both have an interest in and coordinate their purchasing policies, the ways in which they secure the contracts for those materials with each other so they don't engage in you know, a, a ruinous competition? And, and I think that's the way that the, the Biden administration uh, thinks this can be diffused. There are still major tensions here because it's an ad hoc, case-by-case uh, by almost by definition, you, you you work through the details, and I gather that um, even on something like strategic raw materials, there is considerable concern in the American labor movement because 
um, it sounds like imports and imports sounds like free trade and that's anatomy and we can't go there. So then the Biden administration has to do a lot of work in figuring out what compromise, what balance between, you know, restarting domestic production in the United States of rare earths um, and minerals um, and and coordinated import policies with the Europeans will will be will be compatible with the bargains they need to do domestically. So it's a it's a the move is not away from cooperation but towards cooperation on the basis of a series of more ad hoc or technically specific arrangements, as opposed to the big broad brush principles based legally sanctioned and anchored regimes that the WTO epitomized. And just to clarify, is this coordination happening in the um, context of this trade and technology council? I've heard many people cite this as the forum that it, where this cooperation between the US and EU is is happening? Is that the kind of forum that will be sort of the economic alliance, will be coalescing in that TTC forum, the sort of analogous to sort of the military alliance of NATO? Something like that. Yeah, NATO always had a technology component. But yes, I believe that is indeed the vehicle that they have in mind for this. So if we're thinking of a kind of open, hostile confrontation as potentially ruinous and catastrophic. I mean, what is the alternative? I mean, what does competition with China without confrontation look like? I mean, China clearly wants more influence in the world, but how revisionist can that approach reasonably be without qualifying as a, a threat to the United States that, that it needs to respond to? I think this is the most fundamental question, and it's really difficult to see what the positive answer is, which is the gist of my, you know, my piece for foreign policy. I mean, I think Janet Yellen and the Biden administration as a whole are actually sincere in saying that they want to be able to cooperate with China on key issues of common global concern like climate. They want fair competition in a whole variety of areas, which of course is which is demanding of the Chinese because it requires the Chinese to abandon various aggressive industrial policies they've been pursuing for decades and subsidy regimes, which they justified as a developing state and China in its current status can no longer really claim that. So that's a whole field of argument, but it's a field of argument about, you know, trade policy and industrial subsidies, not what in the end is the crux of the issue, which is this issue of power and of security. It's couched in a limited way when it's described as a matter of national security. But when you actually, as it were, scratch the surface and ask how America defines its national security, it is so capacious and is not has not fundamentally been revised since the period of unipolarity, I think, such that America's desire for national security, in fact, implies that sentence that Janet Yellen just slipped in, which is there are plenty of ways of imagining Chinese economic growth that do not challenge American economic leadership. And of course, from Beijing's point of view, the leadership is the issue, right? And, and beyond leadership, the very presumption of the United States in defining who is the leader and what the leader is, right? And, and what order, the, the very fact that the presumption is that America arrogates to itself the right to simply stake out the scope for Chinese competition, economic development, with regard to this crucial proviso and condition that it must not essentially change the status quo. And insofar as that remains there, right, insofar as America says, on the one hand, we're all in favor of cooperation and fair competition, just so long as it doesn't fundamentally challenge our economic leadership, this seems to me, I think, to be a really profound and uh, inescapable problem. I mean, extremely expert, you know, broad-minded, cosmopolitan American experts will talk in terms of essentially whether or not China meets the conditions for admission to, quote, unquote, the top table, for instance, of global finance. This is a sort of, you know, a, a turn of phrase which, which, you'll, which you'll hear banded about. And of course, from, from China's point of view, and indeed from the point of view of many other players in the global system, that conception of the world order as one in which there is a top table, access to which is defined, regulated by a set of criteria that are defined by the incumbents and above all by the United States, a test which they have to meet before they can be invited to that, that entire structure is illegitimate and unacceptable. And now, you know, there's a limit to 
what they can do about it. And the you know, for instance, the World Bank and IMF are constituted the way they are. And it's very difficult to see how we get substantial change in the balance of quotas uh, within those. And Congress made an unholy fuss over changing very, very small changes to China's IMF quota. But if that doesn't happen, and it doesn't happen in the foreseeable future, the natural response would, of course, then to be build alternative institutions. Those then become objects of rivalry. And all of a sudden we have, you know, as we did over the Asian Investment Bank, a determined effort by the United States to resist the decision by Europeans, and notably the British at the time, to actually join the Asian Investment Bank, as they see it as a, you know, something they can't be outside of because of China's importance in the world economy. So at this at this level, it's very difficult to see what the compromise is. I mean, fundamentally, the way out of this, and it's unpalatable to say, because of the implications are very grievous, as we see in Hong Kong, for instance, and they might very well be grievous for Taiwan as well. The only way out of this, short of confrontation, is to sort of wrap our heads around, accommodate peaceful change, which gives Beijing a vastly greater voice but as it were, one that is commensurate with its weight within the world economy across global institutions. Um, and this doesn't just extend to China. I mean, it clearly extends to India. Like, why does India not have a seat in the, in the UN Security Council? It's, it's absurd, right? Uh, how do Western societies, democracies, former unipolar powers like the United States accommodate themselves to this shift? I think that is... That is the challenge. And it's a huge challenge, not for, for politics of all stripes. I think it's a particular challenge for progressive politics, which, after all, you know, for, for some reason, thinks of itself as the champion of various types, various notions of rights, uh, which are then universal rights, human rights. And that's the scale of the challenge that we face here. Um, and it's crystallizing in these economic issues, but I think it goes far beyond that. Correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like you're also saying this could, even in the best case scenario, could flow naturally from economic developments, even without distortions from national security actors? This is the question that Larry Summers asked in a very prescient op-ed a couple of years ago now. Like, imagine China had fully played by every single rule in the WTO book. Fully, fully, fully. Like, do we really believe that we would not have ended up in this situation of conflict? I mean, China's military expenditure by itself is actually not even enough to, you know, it's a share of GDP, however, however much you add on to it, right, however sort of many dark budgets you imagine the Chinese have out there, it's still significantly lower than the United States spend on defense. In proportional terms, not just in absolute terms, but in proportional terms. So all China had to do was make a modest military effort and grow at the pace that it did. And we're in this situation. And, and so this comes down to the fact that, you know, two things are true. It is it is a communist regime under the dominance of a self-confident direct descendant of the Mao, Stalin, Lenin era, right? I mean, that's, and the West did not win the Cold War. I mean, what we're waking up to is the fact that we won the Cold War in Europe, but the West consistently was fought to a stalemate at very best, if not just flat out lost in Korea and Vietnam and with regard to China, right? And then, and the, and the second, and so and the, the follow-on is not just that this is a regime which has fundamentally different politics from anything in the West, but but it is for that same reason, and evidently, despite the you know Nixon and, and Kissinger in China moment, was never incorporated into the American security system. And so, unlike Japan, which of course had an American-shaped political system and nevertheless ran into huge, you know, a buzzsaw of American hostility in the 1980s, Japan, in the end, of course, was part of the American security umbrella. China is the end, the opposite of that. So, yes, it's very difficult to see how. Economic growth, it's one of the real blind spots in the entire globalization discourse from the 90s onwards, which was that it was under the premise that, yes, this is all great. Oh, but it mustn't change the, you know, the geopolitical balance. And China would have had to demilitarize year by year. right? It would literally have had to die back. And it did a pretty good job of that, for heaven's sake. You know, in a booming Chinese economy, it's not like the best and the brightest from Peking University in Xinhua are like streaming into the Chinese military. <laughs> you know, it's not, they, the Chinese military had to work incredibly hard to actually recruit graduates, and they have, and they've worked very hard at it now, and they've devised mechanisms for doing it. But the economic boom by itself tended to demilitarize China. But they would have had to make an extraordinary effort to maintain the balance of power as it was in the early 1990s. I mean, it would have been impossible. They would have had to do a German, you know, they would have had to do not just the Germany, but an even more dramatic act of disarmament. 
uh, you know, unthinkable for a regime like this. It sounds like we need a new term other than Thucydides trap, uh, because yeah, we could leave the kind of military developments almost uh, out of it. Yeah, more like the globalization dilemma or something like that. Yeah, I'd, uh, I'd, I'd propose two's trap or one's and two's trap. We, we've been discussing it now for 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 a little while on this podcast, um, but. Um, but yeah, I do think we need to, to leave the discussion here for now. Um, uh, I imagine we'll be returning to some of the subjects that we discussed in future podcasts. Ones and Twos is written and edited by me, Cameron Abadi, along with Adam Twos. It is produced by Laura Rossbrow Tellum and Rob Sachs. Our social media manager is Claudia Tady. The executive editor of FP Podcasts is Dan Efron. This show is made possible through the support of foreign policy readers. If you're interested not just in Adam Tews, but news and analysis from around the world, consider subscribing. Ones and Twos listeners even get a 15% discount. Just go to foreignpolicy.com slash subscribe and use the promo code TOOZ at checkout. That is T-O-O-Z-E. And listeners, as always, we love hearing your feedback. You can send us voice messages on the Ones and Twos homepage on foreignpolicy.com, or you can email us, podcasts at foreignpolicy.com, or tweet us. That's at Ones and Twos Pod. Thanks very much for listening, and we will see you back in your feed next week. <laughs>